this community conversation for all about mental health, racism, and racial trauma, part one. We start with the first of two programs in our mini series on mental health, race, and racial trauma within the, co within the context of COVID-19. Today, we will focus on the impact of these factors on adults. Part two on Thursday afternoon, same time, will focus on speaking with children and helping other family members cope. Let me set the stage just a bit. It can easily be said that we find ourselves at this point in time at the crossroads and in the midst of two pandemics, two public health crises, COVID-19 and the barrage of stunt and racially motivated physical assaults. And the two compound one another in ways we have perhaps never witnessed before. The effects, unprecedented spikes in our communities of physical illness and accompanying mental stress, anxiety, depression, sadness, fear, and the like. Each of us has a perspective each of us has a story to tell or a history that may, may be painfully recalled by these current events. Each of us is filled with emotion and looking for ways to cope with what we are experiencing. Some are marching, some are grieving, and many are looking for answers. For the African American community and other people of color, the impact of what we are seeing and experiencing is magnified. The disproportionate health impact of COVID-19 is now well known on communities of colors and the images of police misconduct and racial injustice bring up for many years of emotional pain. Emotions have been laid bare and feelings are raw. So how do we deal with all of that? To lead our conversation today are three excellent down to earth presenters. Dr. Brittany Parham, Assistant Professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, Center for School Mental Health. Dr. Parham has a decade of experience training school administrators, educators, and school police on the effects of trauma and effective health interventions for trauma-exposed youth. Dr. Dana Cunningham, Faculty Consultant at the National Center for School Mental Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dr. Cunningham is a licensed clinical psychologist with significant experience providing direct service in urban school districts, as well as training and technical providing training and technical assistance to state and local education and mental health agencies. Dr. Sharon Hoover, associate professor in, professor in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in the School of Medicine. She's the co-director of the National Center for School Mental Health and the director of the Center for Safe Supportive Schools. Recently, she's been providing support and assistance to school districts, children, and families during COVID-19. Before I turn the program over to them, a few housekeeping remarks. The content of today's presentations will deal with issues that many may find distressing. While the intent is not to cause additional stress for anyone, this content and this conversation are of vital importance to understanding mental well-being and safeguarding ourselves against the issues we are confronting today, both COVID-19 and the persistent racial injustice and trauma that we see impacting people of all ages. If at any time you feel overwhelmed or memories of your past are triggered in a way that is distressing, feel free to take a break from the webinar for whatever period of time you might like and rejoin us if and when you choose. Also, there'll be various points in the presentation for you to respond to and record your thoughts and reflections with the presenters in the question and answer feature on your screen. They will only be seen by the presenters. You can also pose questions in the Q&A box. We'll take as many questions as we can toward the latter portion of the webinar. If you write a question, please preface it. Put at the front just a Q so we'll know to be able to distinguish questions from your reflections. This presentation is designed to provide general information. It is not a substitute for individual medical or mental health advice. Please reach out to your healthcare provider for specific information 
guidance or recommendations if you need to. If you would like more information related to COVID-19, please feel free to visit our website as, at www.ums.org slash coronavirus. And with that, ladies. Thank you so much for the introduction. We appreciate the context setting. And again, I'm Sharon Hoover, and I'm privileged to be here today with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Parham Patterson and Dr. Cunningham. We want to give you a brief outline of what we hope to talk about today. But as was already said, we hope that this will be somewhat of a conversation. And so we do encourage you to enter both your questions, but also your reflections into the Q&A section. So as you can see here, we're going to start out by speaking relatively briefly on the mental health impact of COVID-19, specifically because this is part of a COVID-19 response series, but we'll be speaking specifically to the intersection of COVID-19 with disproportionality and its disproportionate impact on communities of color and also on the intersection with racism. We'll then move to the topics of racism and racial trauma. And hopefully throughout, and especially toward the end of our discussion, we'll be sharing some coping strategies and specific resources. We will also welcome your ideas and your experiences about coping strategies and resources that have been successful for you, for your family, or your community. As Donna already mentioned, some of what we'll talk about today is sensitive in content and may cause some feelings of heightened distress. And we encourage you to only take in what feels right to you right now and to practice self-care, as you can see here in this image. We will review some coping strategies at the end that can help with some of that self-care and caring for your family. And we'll talk a little bit later about uh, another webinar coming up that will be speaking specifically to caring for your families. We first wanna get you used to using the Q&A feature of the site. So we have a question that we're presenting to you, but we'd encourage you to respond in the Q&A section. So we'd like to hear from you first. What are the biggest mental health concerns related to COVID-19 that you are seeing in your own community? So feel free, feel encouraged to go to the Q&A section and type in your responses to this question. And again, just keep in mind, these will only be seen by the panelists today, and we'll share some themes at the end of this brief section on COVID-19. So we wanna speak uh, for a moment about the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. And many of us have been not only experiencing the mental health impact, but also learning more about it. And we had uh, anticipated a pretty significant increase in negative mental health consequences of this global pandemic, in part just from what we've seen in other community disasters or community crises. So we anticipated, for example, increases in anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress responses. And we now increasingly have data to confirm that reality. And as we know, there are many reasons why this negative impact on mental health is occurring, some of which are listed here. We know that social distancing is not only unnatural and really interferes with uh, typical daily routines, but it also leads to isolation and loneliness for many people and disruptions in family routines. We've seen significant closures of businesses and schools in an effort to protect public health, but those too come with significant consequences, not only economic consequences, but also significant disruptions in families' lives and in individuals' lives. We've already mentioned isolation. We know that shelter in place and staying in one's uh, home environment can really lead to isolation, especially for those with limited family or social contacts during this time. And even just the disrupted daily routine for young people and for adults uh, can be incredibly anxiety provoking and lead to significant sadness or post-traumatic stress symptoms. And finally, the job loss and economic burden cannot be understated. We know that this has had a significant impact in entire communities and within homes. And this in and of itself has truly led to some significant impact on mental health functioning. 
I do want to note that we've also seen tremendous hope and resilience and strength in communities, despite some of the negative uh, mental health impact as they contend with this devastating illness. Briefly, we want to just highlight uh, that we do know uh, in, on the next slide, we share a bit of data on the signs of distress that are reported by community members uh, related to COVID-19. So these rates, as we ask individuals about just their experiences of distress, but also specifically about their experiences of anxiety or depression, the rates are much higher than we would typically see. And we know this is compounded by other events that are happening in our nation right now that we're gonna be speaking to specifically. And these are significantly increased for families that report job reduction or loss, as you can see uh, here, that the numbers are greater of people feeling distressed or feeling anxious or depressed. We also have seen people reporting greater use of substances, greater binge drinking, greater use of prescription drugs and other drugs. And so we know from increasing data that there is a significant impact on mental health. We also know, uh, and one of the most troubling and illuminating and perhaps not surprising pieces of information that we've learned from the impact of COVID-19 is its disproportionate impact on communities of color and particularly on black communities. And we also know, as we illustrate here, that communities of color are disproportionately impacted by less access to and lower quality of healthcare uh, in a variety of healthcare settings. And you can see some of that information highlighted here. So we know that communities of color receive fewer services than their white counterparts with comparative health insurance. We know that they're more likely to experience mistreatment in health settings and misdiagnosis. We know that individuals and communities of color receive lower quality mental health care and often irrelevant or inappropriate interventions. And finally, we also know from the data and from experiences of our communities of color that they are less likely to receive psychoeducation or information related to mental health treatment specifically. And you can see the data here related to COVID that this disproportionality has resulted in a devastating differential impact for black communities and individuals relative to white communities and individuals. So as illustrated here, we see that COVID-19 is disproportionately killing black Americans. And this is uh, according to data released by several states. We wanted to set this stage as part of our broader conversation today on racism and racial trauma, and as part of our conversation on coping during this time. Um, in part, uh, we, we do this because this is part of a series on COVID response, but we also know that systemic racism really is at the heart of some of the heavy burden that black communities are bearing related to COVID. So I wanna go ahead and ask uh, Dr. Parham Patterson if there have been any reflections before we move on to have Dr. Cunningham speak of the topic of racism specifically. Were there any reflections? Absolutely, thank you so speak? much, Dr. Yes, are you able to hear me okay? I think I saw a head nod, wonderful. Um, and so as Dr. Hoover talked with us a little bit, not surprisingly, a number of the points that she hit on came through in the reflection share via the question and answer feature. And so many folks were endorsing feelings of isolation or observing isolation of themselves and the isolation of others that they care about, which are contributing to significantly increased mental health concerns and challenges, including depression, anxiety, and feelings of helplessness, especially as many of the folks on the line seem to be educators or caregivers that are supporting others um, and youth in particular. There are many concerns about how our kids are doing, how they're coping with everything that's going on around them, and for many, concerns around kids not having their needs met, basic needs that we know all of us rely on to feel safe, supported, and as if we can grow and thrive in our given communities. And so we just appreciate you all attending this conversation today and participating with us along the way. We'll continue to see your responses in the question and answer boxes, so feel free to keep dialoguing with us, but those are just some of the, the core messages that are coming through very consistently in our question and answer box. I do believe that um, Dr. Cunningham may be having some technical challenges right now. I'm not sure if um, Donna, if you can give me an indication whether or not that's been worked out for her. 
I apologize, Don. I believe you're on mute. I, I am sorry. I think she's still working on it. I don't think she's gotten back in, but she was going out and coming in again. Her screen was frozen. All right. Well, until we're able to get her screen up and functioning, that's what teams are for. And so I am no Dr. Cunningham, but I can certainly support in this area. So um, as Dr. Hooper started to allude, we want to spend more time today talking about racism and racial trauma, given the context of um, highly publicized violence against persons of color in the media that have existed for a long time, but also are just very clearly public. And um, it's information that we're all responding to right now, hopefully in very healthy ways going forward. And so there's some terms that we really wanna ensure we have a good understanding of. And so let's start with individual racism. Um, and as you see here, those are the individual beliefs that another group is inferior um, to another. And some examples are listed here, such as holding negative thoughts or stereotypes about a specific group um, that are may or may not have some truth, but in general, stereotypes being used for different groups can be harmful and are representative, representative of an individual type of racism. Now, institutional racism, um, that is more of where the conversations now within organizations are headed. And that's thinking specifically through the practices and policies within organizations that impact the rights and access of specific group members to critical means, such as promotion um, strategies, access to opportunities, bank lending policies, and housing um, policies. There's also structural racism, and we're hearing a lot more very productive conversation around um, the impact of structural racism, but that really captures laws, customs, and practices that can typically lead to inequities and adverse outcomes for people of color with significant advantages for those who identify as white Americans, such as sentencing laws in the legal system, healthcare access, and education access and opportunities. I think on the next slide, we'll get into a little bit more detail. Um, important for this conversation is um, understanding of a term um, called implicit bias. And so these are attitudes and stereotypes that occur unconsciously. So they can occur without our individual awareness. And it's important because those attitudes and stereotypes that we have actually affect how we interact with individuals and how we make decisions whether or not we realize it. And so those are our attitudes, behaviors, and decisions that can be significantly affected and impact folks that we're engaging with. Um, and so important to know is that implicit biases, they can be positive, but the more concerning challenge is that they can also be negative. Um, everyone has them. And so that's something that I just wanna lay on the table. We all have biases because we're human. And it's a very human brain-based function. Um, and that our implicit biases, so those unconscious, attitudes and stereotypes may actually conflict with our stated beliefs. And so, for example, while I may say that I am in support of LGBTQ plus rights, some of the ways in which I act, my implicit biases may suggest otherwise. And so it's important to attend to implicit biases that we know come up just through our socialization, what we're exposed to in the media, and what we hear, the messaging that we hear around us quite frequently. Um, those two may conflict, but to be aware of both is essential. And it's, as I kind of noted, shaped by a variety of factors, including media, upbringing, life experiences, and they're developed over time, which makes them particularly challenging. So if we're a person who has never heard of this term before, and we're a little bit older, as you would imagine, it takes some time to undo and address, but it's worth addressing because implicit biases affect so significantly the decisions that we make every day. And we also wanted to talk a little bit about, oh, sorry, I believe we went past one slide. Thank you so much. Microaggression. So some folks may have heard this terminology before, um, but it's an expression of subtle verbal and nonverbal insults um, and messages because of someone's identity. And they may not feel so major or impactful because they can sound something like you talk so proper. 
out of context, that may even feel like a compliment depending on who you are. But for certain individuals, talking proper may have an assumption that someone is talking more white um, or that's not the way in which they should be talking. Perhaps they should sound differently. And as a person of color um, who is also working at a university, I'm someone who always received that feedback as a young person growing up in the world, as I'm sure many folks on the line have experienced too. Um, or here we see um, a reference to clutch purses in the presence of a black male, for instance. And so that can be an indicator um, that someone has implicit biases, perhaps fearing um, someone that represents a certain identity, and they react by potentially clutching the purse as if that's indicating um, the person cannot actually grab the purse or that they're fearful of an individual. It can, microaggressions can be conscious or unintentional again, getting back at that implicit bias concept. Um, and the folks who are most likely to experience microaggressions on a daily basis are folks who identify as African American, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, and they often experience them in most settings. And so um, we'll get more into detail about that later in our presentation. But the important piece here is that the accumulation of microaggressions over time contribute to the marginalized experience of persons of color over time. And that's what we'll spend more of our conversation toward the latter end today. All righty. So as we mentioned, um, we would like to keep you all engaged in this discussion with us. And we have another question for you to be thinking about as we dive into the next se section. And so, what are some of the emotions you have been experiencing as a result of highly publicized violent events and the increased focus on social justice? And so while folks are typing into the Q&A function, I will begin describing more specifically um, trauma and racial trauma. Okay. And thank you for those already starting to type. Um, we wanted to take a step back and just revisit this notion of trauma before going any further. While many may be familiar, um, I just want to be clear that a trauma is essentially an event or events that are experienced as physically or emotionally harmful um, or that are threatening to life. Also important to know is that traumas can have lasting effects on individuals. And what is considered a trauma is really focused on the experience of a scary event. So while two people may observe the same really scary incident, perhaps only one walks away from that instance feeling like it was a trauma. And so the perception of a given event matters more than actually what happened at times. And so what are some examples of traumas? Um, family violence, such as child abuse or child physical and sexual abuse, as well as domestic violence. Also parental mental health issues or substance abuse issues, um, living in poverty, um, or having to cope and live in a life um, um, subjected to unstable housing or housing instability. Involvement in a serious accident, such as a car accident or a house fire, could also be considered a trauma, as well as community violence and exposure to racism and discrimination. Now, on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about the effects of trauma. And so um, there has been longstanding research um, focused on adverse childhood experiences that started back in the 70s. But what we know from that literature is that traumas and the consequences of traumas result in long-term issues for individuals, such as in a youth um, or school-age individuals, you might anticipate some academic problems or increased likelihood for school failure. You may also see increased mental health challenges and comorbidities. Comorbidities meaning that someone may not only just have depression, they may also have anxiety and PTSD as a result of their experiences of trauma. Folks exposed to trauma are also more likely to become smokers or be at higher risk for substance abuse issues in the future. They're also more likely to, to encounter physical health conditions such as heart disease and cancer. And what may come as no surprise at this point, the research also clearly, clearly illustrates a shorter lifespan. Um, and 20 years is actually what the literature has found that the lifespan of individuals exposed to traumas, particularly those exposed to multiple traumas, 
are likely to lose almost 20 years off of their life. So we know it's important to attend to. And as we think more specifically about racial trauma, we just want you to have this in mind that the impact is long understood and serious. And so there's some a role that we all have to play as individuals in supporting those who may be more susceptible to traumas, particularly our persons of color. Dr. Parham, before you get to the next slide, I want you to know that Dr. Cunningham is back with us. Welcome back, Dr. Cunningham. It's so good to see you. <laughs> and we'll get to hear from her a little bit later as well. So you didn't miss out quite yet. We're glad she's back. All right, to dive a little bit deeper into racial trauma. And so racial trauma is defined as the cumulative effects of racism and discrimination on an individual's physical and mental health. And so what we know is that exposure to racism and discrimination further increases the likelihood that individuals are going to experience significant anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. And so when compared to folks who have been exposed to a trauma, those exposed to racial trauma, which again can occur daily and is very commonplace um, experience for persons of color at times, they're more likely to have higher rates of mental health challenges and more likely to have comorbidities and so additional mental health challenges more than just one due to experiences with racial trauma. And so what groups are most likely to be exposed? At the top here, we have African Americans um, who are most likely to be exposed to racial, discrim racial discrimination um, and prejudice. And so here are a couple examples. And so in 2019, while African Americans only made up 13% of the population, 24% of the individuals killed by police were black. And so this, this really just represents the disproportionate susceptibility of African Americans to violence perpetrated by police um, or, or more use of lethal means with African Americans by police. Um, another example here is of black women um, who are three to four times more likely to experience a pregnancy-related death as compared to their white counterparts. Here for both examples, we call into question the role of implicit bias, um, one of those definitions shared earlier, and how important it is to understand how our feelings, whether conscious, which would be explicit or unconscious, that being implicit biases, affect our decision. And so in the um, example of African-American women experiencing pregnancy-related death, you can imagine how if an individual has views about women of color, they may not be as likely to take um, that woman of color's perspective as serious when they complain about aches and pains that feel atypical post-pregnancy or during pregnancy and how that can result in more deaths of certain groups of individuals. Indigenous people, Latinx and Asian Americans are also significantly more likely to experience um, race-based stressors. And so one survey coming out of a college sample just gives us a snapshot where 15% uh, 15.8% of students reported experiencing race-based bullying and harassment, which means it's quite common. Um, and as we would expect, there are serious negative mental and physical health consequences associated with those types of experiences. Also, just really important to note right now is in the wake of COVID-19, our, our Asian Americans or descendants of Asian populations are at increased risk of racist and discriminatory violent acts directed at them. And so right now, as we're observing the media, we're seeing um, just this significantly and drastically increased um, hate and discriminatory actions taken against those who represent Asian populations. And to get a little bit deeper into racial trauma um, and some of the imp important terminologies. Um, so race-based traumatic stress, um, similar to what we might expect from someone who's just experienced a, a serious car accident, for instance, directly following that racist experience that was perceived as a racial trauma, this terminology is used to describe the physiological, psychological, and emotional damage that can occur and can contribute to feelings of anxiety um, or fear um, or lack of trust in the world following a scary event. Again, what's important here is the perception. And so while people of color are likely to experience microaggressions on a daily basis, um, those may not result in a traumatic racial experience or racial trauma. 
However, an event that is uh, more severe or perceived as more severe by the individual or could have resulted in death, that event could potentially, could potentially result in race-based traumatic stress, increasing the presentation um, symptoms of someone who's been traumatized by a um, racially charged or discriminatory event. Intergenerational trauma. This is another important word as we talk about racial and trauma. And this really describes the negative consequences associated with historical oppression and transmission of those consequences across generations. And there's been some literature to show us more of what this means. And so, for example, in Holocaust survivors, um, their children were assessed through research. And what they found is that the children of Holocaust survivors had higher cortisol levels. Cortisol is a stress hormone produced by the brain. And so when an event is, when a scary event is observed, cortisol is produced to help an individual act. The amount of cortisol in the system also contributes to how scary the event is and how traumatic it can be. And so for the child of a Holocaust survivor, if they're observing a scary event with a peer who has not had that experience and does not have that increased level of cortisol already, which was passed down from generations before, they are more likely to perceive a scary event as traumatic. And that's so important again, because we know about the negative outcomes associated with traumatic exposures long-term. Finally, I wanna hit on secondary traumatic stress and vicarious trauma. These are terminologies that help us to understand that trauma does not just affect the individual who experiences the trauma directly, similar to intergenerational trauma, but indirectly folks who are caring for young people who have been exposed to scary events or caring for elderly or any group of individuals who are suffering with the symptoms of trauma, you too are at risk of potentially um, developing symptoms of um, anxiety or PTSD simply from being exposed to the content regularly. Um, and one clear example here is that African-Americans are particularly at risk right now for secondary traumatic stress and vicarious trauma as these videos of police brutality are so frequently available to us via the media. And so one common strategy that many are using to cope is simply minimizing exposure to that type of content these days. And just to kind of bring it all together, what we see is this cycle. The reason we want to have this conversation is because we know there's a cycle to be disrupted. Historical trauma makes it likely that certain populations are going to inherit some of the trauma from, um, from experiences of their ancestors. And while that they may start off you know, exposed to higher cortisol levels, there is something that each of us can do as the providers that come in contact or the parents of the young person um, to set up their environment for success so that we can disrupt those cycles. Knowing that there's a history of trauma that folks are willing or likely to um, 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 that are likely to be transmitted to younger generations, we know that it's more important now than ever to set up safe, protective environments. And in the future, next couple of days, we'll actually be having a session focused just on working with kids and, and access to resources that will help them to talk about some of these challenging situations surrounding racial trauma um, and helping them to cope with the environment around them and helping those other populations, so our white Americans and our other majority populations, depending on where you are situated, um, to be supportive of and accepting of um, um, the subpopulations that are at highest risk for en enduring racial traumas. As we've already kind of described, we know the exposure to racial trauma is similar to exposure to other traumas, except for we just want to hit on the idea that racial trauma exacerbates what we already know about trauma broadly. Um, and so emotional distress right now in communities of color is quite high. And that's something that gets back to some of the commentary that was in the question and answer boxes earlier during our presentation. And so many folks are right now feeling silenced while there's still a lot of dialogue and social media, many are, are, are have yet to speak out depending on the environment in which they find themselves at work, for instance, or amongst colleagues. Um, amongst peers, they may not feel so comfortable sharing their perspective and what they're experiencing related to the potential racial, tra racial trauma they're enduring day to day or just through indirect exposure to the media. Many persons of color, their experiences are often minimized. 
Um, again, that, that understanding of implicit bias is important here because um, when someone comes forth with their experiences, it's easy if we don't have an understanding about what are common challenges for a subpopulation to dismiss what they're saying or, or think of it as not as bad as they're trying to express. And so oftentimes persons of color can feel like their experiences are minimized or not taken as seriously. Um, there are also these persistent feelings of invalidation, fear, and helplessness, which gets back to many of the comments that I saw populating in the chat box. And as we know, there are serious outcomes, negative outcomes that we want to be aware of and help to prevent, such as um, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and generally just higher stress when compared to other white counterparts who also, in, also endure traumas, but not racial traumas. And I believe on the next slide, it's just one more kind of summary slide to bring it all together. That long term, we know the impact of trauma is very significant and racial trauma in particular. We know that there are certain subpopulations that are at higher risk of having um, um, less than positive educational outcomes. And so they're not as likely to graduate high school at the same high rates that we would expect of our nation's youth. Um, there's increased um, diagnoses and disability status is assigned to youth of color, where we find an over-representation of African-Americans in special education systems and under-representation of persons of color in gifted and talented programs. We know that long-term job selection becomes a question, and it's hard to know um, whether someone's selection for a job um, or, non or lack of selection for a job was related to the race and how they were perceived. Um, we also know that long-term, um, as my colleague Dr. Hoover mentioned earlier, healthcare access and experiences for persons of color are very, um, have, have significantly been demonstrated to be much more negative um, than when compared to their white counterparts because their issues are not taken as seriously or where um, the quality of care is just not what would be expected due to some implicit biases that affect the judgment and decision-making of their care providers. And so with that, um, I wanna turn it over to one of my colleagues to give us just a little bit of a flavor for some of the question and answer reflections that we saw from our participants today. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm glad I'm able to join you all again. I had a little technical difficulties, but I'm back and uh, connected. So we saw in the chat box that people uh, really experience and express a wide range of feelings from um, completely feeling overwhelmed, um, anger, rage, confusion. Um, we saw a lot of comments about um, shame and guilt. Um, and also though, a lot of um, some energy and excitement about um, and passion about the work that's happening now related to social justice and people feeling optimistic about some of the changes that might be coming forth. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham. We are happy you are back. And we want to move on before we move to our question and answer period. We, we've seen so many questions coming in, and we do hope to have some time to answer at least some of those. We want to take a moment to talk about coping and resources. And we first want to ask all of you, since you have been so participatory today, everyone sharing uh, their good ideas and thoughts and feelings and experiences, we'd like to ask you to enter into the Q&A box what you are doing to cope during this time. So if you can enter that, and then we're going to share some ideas about coping and also some resources. So as you can see, there are a number of recommended coping strategies uh, for people. And the reality is that different coping strategies work uh, for different people. And so it's important that you figure out really what works best for you. And these are just some ideas with some data behind them to show that they can be effective. So the first is to limit your intake of news and social media. And you have to do this to the extent that you feel comfortable. Uh, for some, it's really important to stay informed 24-7, uh, but we also know that that can have a real detrimental effect on your ability to carry out your daily functioning and to have uh, well-being. And so if you feel distressed by what's in the media, you may want to consider limiting your consumption of social media and even engaging with some positive news sites. There are news sites that are specifically focused on uplifting stories from around the world, which have been demonstrated to have a positive impact on people's mental health. 
We encourage you to maintain your routine and engage in healthy activities. So you wanna strike a balance between keeping up with current events and also going about your daily life. And basic acts of self-care can make a real difference, like taking breaks while working or studying, connecting more often with family and friends, maybe taking on fewer commitments or engaging in spiritual or religious practices. We encourage you to practice relaxation. You can try self-soothing strategies, whether it's walking or deep breathing or listening to music or whatever you find helpful. Recognizing your limits. Remember that you may not be as efficient or productive as usual. You may need more time to complete tasks or you may need to just say no to certain tasks and that is okay. And we've encouraged all of our colleagues and community members to give yourself permission to do so and just plan accordingly uh, for the support that you may need uh, when you do set those limits. Engage in healthy communication and seek out community. Sharing your experiences or ideas with others can be a way to strengthen positive community values and shared identities. And you wanna check in with each other as well. Even if you don't know the right things to, to say, just being with others during difficult times can be really powerful. Acknowledging feelings, reactions to the events that are happening now really do vary from person to person, as we've seen in our chat box today even. Some experience very intense feelings, while others may experience what seems like very little or even nothing at all in moments. And we encourage you to allow yourself to feel what you feel and not judge your own personal experience or the experience of others. Get active. Uh, when we feel powerless, it's important to find ways to have a voice. You might get involved in activism, join organizations, attend events, talk to others about what you value or work to protect others' rights. And then finally, surrounding yourself with safe people. So we encourage you as you're thinking today about your own coping strategies, maybe even to list out or to think of those people that you feel the most safe and supported by, and to the extent possible, even if it's in, in a distance fashion, to surround yourself with those people. And I'm going to pass it to Dr. Cunningham, who's going to share some coping strategies and resources specifically for the Black community. Thanks, Dr. Hoover. So, um, you know, these uh, more recent events, particularly related to social injustice, have really taken a toll on many people in the Black community. And so sometimes, um, you know, our experiences might be a little different than, than others. And so it's really helpful to think about what might be most um, helpful for you as you cope with the current climate and the current situation. Um, uh, particularly for some people, you may feel just more comfortable kind of staying closer in your sphere of influence and really just talking about what your experiences have been with close family and friends. You may not really feel comfortable sharing your experiences with people outside of your family or outside of your um, close-knit community. Um, I know many people in the Black community are relying very strongly in this time on their um, faith and spirituality um, for a source of social support, emotional support, spiritual support. So uh, certainly that is a good place to be able to express how you feel. And, and if you need to feel uplifted, um, certainly many people report um, feeling better after, after participating in those sorts of services. Um, and all the focus on and conversation on racism and police brutality can certainly be very overwhelming and very taxing emotionally. So it's also really important to know when it's helpful for you to disengage from some of those conversations and engage in some more self-care activities um, through things that are self-soothing for you. So whether that be um, taking a walk, exercising, spending time with friends and family, um, just really think about what you need in that moment and um, trying to come up with a plan to address uh, whatever is whatever um, your need is in that moment. Um, and we know that kind of really focusing on uh, a lot of people want to really take action right now and do some things differently. Um, and other people are maybe not be at that place right now. Um, so if there are ways that you want to become more active, there certainly are um, several organizations that you can get involved involved with to help take some more action in your community um, and also statewide. We can go to, yep, and there are also several um, organizations that are focused on sharing information and resources uh, for the Black community, whether it be related to mental health or um, just additional information related to coping and wellness. Um, there are some listed here. 
that therapy for black girls and therapy for, for black men um, also have websites if you're specifically interested in finding a therapist of color. Um, they have therapist directories, melanin and mental health. Um, also are very active on social media. So if you just kind of want a quick uh, tidbit of information, um, many of these organizations also have um, lots of information available on Instagram and Facebook. Um, the Hill House was offering uh, meditation classes and um, open dialogue forums for people of color to discuss recent events. The Steve Fund is a great resource for uh, black college students to focus on mental health resources and support. Uh, black Mental Wellness has a lot of information on their website about mental health and um, also on their social media accounts about kind of coping with current events and liberate meditation is actually an app that was designed uh, specifically for uh, black people and people of color and um, is provides meditation strategies. And we've also linked here um, some resources on racism um, and anti-racism. There are a lot of really good um, links and tools, some here for therapists, um, many for laypersons, just about understanding race. Um, there's a really great reading list about anti-racism, a racial trauma toolkit. And I know we mentioned systemic racism earlier today. If that was something that you hadn't heard about before and want to learn more about that, there's a link to some information there. And the National Museum of African American History and Culture has uh, added a new site on their website really focused on um, race and bias and has um, separate sections for parents, for educators, for youth. So that's also a good one to check out. All right, so I want to take a quick moment before talking about this slide and just um, review some of the comments, uh, just a couple of comments that have come up in the question and answer box. And so um, there are a lot of folks who are engaging in very healthy coping strategies. I am so impressed with this group. Many folks are exercising, so taking the opportunity to get out and get active. Um, there's also a lot of intentional social engagement. And so COVID-19, of course, makes it particularly challenging during this time where we really need one another to actually be engaged with one another. Um, and so I'm seeing that folks are utilizing Zoom platforms and other FaceTime opportunities uh, to intentionally connect with the folks that make them feel well and feel better. Um, and I also saw an, a, a few notes um, just that I want to say out loud um, that there is a significant role that our systems have in reducing the burden of potential racial traumas, um, but systematic racism on persons of color. And so folks are essentially saying, you know, I'm, I'm worried about going back to work um, because there are so many systemic issues that have yet to be addressed. And that's why we have a number of those resources that we share today, but also we know that there's so much more work to be done by each of our systems that we belong to because we're all working in the same US environment that has um, over time developed into uh, some of the challenges that we were hoping to address. And this is just one conversation of the many conversations we know need to continue. And so please continue to engage with us um, in the chat box and do know that we're gonna share more information and resources come Thursday. This is just a, a little uh, teaser. Um, some folks were asking, do we have resources for talking with youth? We know that they are not too young to start talking about race. Um, early on as babies, what we know from the literature is that babies begin to prefer the faces of folks who look like the individuals who are caring for them most frequently. By the age of four and five, kiddos are starting to express some prejudices that they hear, the messaging that is common in the environments that they find themselves. Um, as a person of color, I can remember my first prejudices and expressing them to my mom who said, you are African-American, you better love yourself, um, which is very positive and uh, a positive perspective from my mom, which is important. And we know that earlier, the earlier we're talking to our kid kiddos, the better, because they are open to learning. Their brains are prepared for whatever it is we have to serve them. Um, but silence is a problem. And so not talking about race specifically, avoiding the content reinforces racism, reinforces prejudices. And so we must counter that by talking with kids early. No matter what it is, we start to talk to them and we'll dig deeper on Thursday about some of those resources for kiddos. With that, I will turn it over um, to Donna. Ladies, thank you so much. That was a plethora of information, very engaging, as you can see from that 
question and answer box that was very, very robust. I would say that the question asked most, and there are many questions, but often, and I could have interrupted earlier, but it was so engaging, I did not want to do that, is will these slides be made available? And I know Dr. Hoover answered a few of you. Yes, I want to make sure that everyone knows that this presentation in its entirety will be online in a couple of days in about 48 hours at ums.org slash not all wounds. I also want everyone to know because there have been a number of questions about COVID related issues only. We've done a mini series of, in three parts about COVID. You can go to that same website, ums.org slash not all wounds, and see the entirety of each of those webinars. One is dealing with COVID and mental health issues generally. One is about isolation and another one, how do I talk to, to my family and to my children about that? So those will be there and I anticipate that we may do some more. There are an unbelievable number of really great questions. So if we can go quickly, I'd like to get to as many as we can. And then as Dr. Parham mentioned, we'll try to pick up some of these additional questions on Thursday as we move forward. So let me just do a rapid fire and see what we can get in today. How's that? Um, first, one of these questions, Dr. Parham, you mentioned childhood trauma. Is there a way to reverse trial childhood trauma? Now, that's an outstanding question. And what we know is that the, the effects of childhood trauma can be very serious. What we also know where we have to spend more of our time focus is that children are so resilient. So we can absolutely help them overcome some of the challenges that they endure as a result of scary events they've been exposed to. Um, and I think just a key strategy is figuring out what they're good at and using it to encourage them to overcome difficult situations. Children can overcome anything when they have supportive adults in their lives um, and protective adults that are informed. And so attending sessions like this, but also just more broadly grasping um, understanding about um, situations that may trigger trauma um, or trigger reminders of previous trauma, such as news and too much exposure to it, is important in just helping kiddos to cope in real time. And of course, we'll get more into that on Thursday. But absolutely, there's so much we can do to support our kiddos exposed to trauma. Just because it happens does not mean that they will be harmed forever um, by that scary event. Thank you. Here's another question. How do we deal with systemic racism on a daily basis so that it doesn't contribute to an increase in incidence of medical and mental health issues? Questions for any of the three of you. That is a huge question, but a very good one. <laughs> um, I think, you know, when we think about um, systemic racism, institutional racism, it's not something that one person can change because these are practices and policies that are have deeply embedded uh, within many institutions and organizations and, and customs uh, really throughout our country. Um, so it really takes a collective effort to really change, to really, first of all, like really examine what policies and practices are in place and, real, and take a look at how they are negatively impacting um, black people and people of color, um, and also identify how uh, white people are maybe um, at advan in, a, in an advantageous state um, due to some of those laws and practices and policies that are in place that really start to help dismantle that system. But um, it definitely can feel very overwhelming to kind of think about how to really um, break down a lot of those barriers that people you know um, i'm really excited and energized about some, a lot of the activities that have taken place and a lot of the conversations that are, are ongoing um, to really start to examine some of these issues that's great here's an interesting another interesting question has any research been done to determine why people use violence to express their racist views for example unprovoked lynchings or beatings of someone from a different race? Anyone? Were you able to hear the question? Do you mind repeating the question? Sure. The question was, has any research been done to determine why people use violence to express their racist view, lynchings or beatings of someone of a different race. 
I don't know of research that's been done on that. I'm sure there has been. I just may not be aware of it. But you know, people have a wide range, a wide variety of ways of expressing their um, hate and anger and um, racism. So for some people, it may be. Um, lynching and be more physically aggressive toward others and other people may engage in um, some of those, you know, microaggressions and have implicit biases that we talked about earlier. So um, why one person engages in more um, harmful, physically harmful behavior, I'm not sure, but people have a wide range certainly of ways of expressing um, their feelings of hate and dislike for, for other populations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just I would have a question. Hey, sorry, sorry, Donna, if you don't mind, um, I'll just add a note on implicit bias. I, I think one thing that we do know from research is that um, implicit biases are likely to come through uh, more explicitly through behaviors of individuals when in, when um, certain folks perceive their, their livelihood or their health to be at risk. And so, as we saw with COVID-19, um, we saw the increased um, violent attacks toward Asian Americans or folks with Asian descent. And so we know that when scary events that compromise, potentially compromise the well being of specific groups, we're more likely to see the implicit and explicit biases come through. And as um, Dr. Cunningham mentioned, people have various ways of expressing um, um, themselves and their biases and racism. However, though it may be a microaggression, the impact can still be serious. And so even if it's not a violent attack, it's important to know even microaggressions have an impact. On the individual that's on the receiving end. Here's a question about healthcare, the healthcare arena. So this um, question is: Are there tips that you can offer to healthcare providers to ensure that I, as a person of color, receive the care I need? So there's actually, I'll, I'll speak uh, briefly to this, and then I would love to hear the views of Dr. Patterson and Dr. Cunningham as well. But we know that there's best practices in this area, and part of it is truly standardizing practice and having checks and balances where colleagues are actually observing uh, the behaviors of their other provider colleagues. So standardizing practices so that every person who walks through the healthcare facility door receives the same practice and that it's not as influenced, it's, it's not as easily influenced by who they are, by their race, by their gender, by their age. So there is good uh, information about best practices on standardizing care. There's certainly uh, some data also to suggest that when care practitioners are provided with data about the disproportionate care and the poor quality of care that people of color receive, that it can influence their behavior in positive ways as well. Other ideas? We uh, are almost near the hour, so let me try to see if we can get in two more questions very quickly. Uh, this question is, I avoid talking about race and racism because the topics are uncomfortable and may lead to conflict. What can I do to better engage in appropriate conversations and to contribute to the conversation? Be comfortable being uncomfortable. <laughs> but but I'll pass the question to Dr. Patterson and Cunningham. Yeah, that's so that's a great question. And I think um, you know, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is a great motto. Um, you know, oftentimes when issues related to race and racism come up, um people you know, often become very defensive or very sensitive about comments and that, you know, the, the conversation instantly gets shut down. Um, so you also have to, it's also helpful to kind of establish some ground rules about a safe space and how you're going to have those conversations and kind of what may, you know, what questions are, are not off limits and how that question, um, you know, how that conversation will be facilitated. But I think um, we can't be scared to have those conversations. We have to put um, kind of the the obvious things that we see and hear and experience every day on the table and have those begin to have those conversations as uncomfortable as they might be. Mm -hmm. And I will just add that we know that silence is harmful. If we're not talking about it, we're doing harm. We're reinforcing what we're trying to avoid. Um, and so avoidance is not an option as it relates to this topic. 
And when we get uncomfortable, that's where we grow. We never grew doing something that was easy for us. And so as individuals, as a collective, we have to just get comfortable being uncomfortable. I love that, Dr. Hoover. That is good. That is good. All right, a last question for today. And again, for our audience, we'll try to collect some of these questions and address them to the extent we can on Thursday when we resume. So we hope you come back with us. This question is, how do you confront or address someone who you know right now in the moment is giving voice to equity and diversity when you know that it's just that, giving voice, and there's no intentional good act behind it? I've seen, um, you know, a lot of statements in the media and, you know, a lot of organizations are putting forth um, their voices of support for the social justice movement. And, you know, one of my immediate questions thereafter is, well, what will they do? You know, a statement is nice, um, you know, a letter is nice, a nice picture on Instagram is nice, but, you know, what are the actions that are going to follow follow um, after that statement. So I would encourage you to hold those organizations and persons accountable and follow up, you know, on what they're doing, what actions, what new policies and practices they're putting in place um, to, to, to ensure and, and, and hold them accountable for what they say they're going to do. Thank you all. Ladies, this has been absolutely amazing. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone out there in, in our audience when I say thank you for the insight and how much you've shared. It's been very, very useful, not only from the science and, and what we know, but also in terms of the coping skills and your address of the questions. So as we close, let me say this. If you're looking for information related, again, specifically to COVID-19, the University of Maryland Medical System has a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week nurse call line, and the number is there on your screen. If you're on the phone, it's one 888 7130711, or you can certainly go to our website at ums.org slash coronavirus. Once again, let me also say that our tripart conference uh, webinar conference on COVID-19 is on our website at ums.org slash not all wounds. Today's session will be up in about 48 hours on that site as well, and therefore the uh, all the content will be available to you the slides will be available to you as well and come back and join us on thursday again at three o'clock as we talk about racism racial trauma in the context of covid and how to help your children and families cope i hope that this has been meaningful to you i've certainly enjoyed it and i'm very grateful for our presenters today for their contributions join us in two days thank you Thank you.